So welcome everyone to the last session of our lecture series on the climate controversies in Southeast Asia. Um, we have a special event planned for this evening. Um, we have a panel discussion between climate justice activists from Southeast Asia in dialogue, in a discussion with climate activists from, from Germany. And the session will be moderated by two activists, um, Lara and uh, Marlin from uh, Fridays for Future uh, student group at, the, at Bonn University. And they will introduce the, uh, the speakers in a minute. Um, I just want to um, say a few words uh, as one of the organizers of this series. Um, I'm, my name is Oliver Pine from um, Bonn University. Um, and I think most of you have, have joined uh, all the lectures or some of the lectures. And um, I think it's become very clear that this lecture series is um, the kind of academic work which is not neutral. We are not neutral uh, with regard to the, the threat of climate change. We're not neutral um, with regard to the issue of climate justice. And we've, um, so the, the kind of academic work we are trying to teach at our department is um, based on science, on natural sciences, on social sciences, but it's um, a, a passionate type of science which is trying to uh, get involved in the world and what, uh, in what's happening in the world. Um, if we look at the, look back at the lecture series, we've, um, we've had inputs based on natural sciences and on social sciences. We've seen that the threat of climate change is already there. It's already happening in Southeast Asia. We've seen the, the huge impact of storms, um, the threat of climate change, of rising sea uh, levels on low-lying delta areas such as the Mekong. Um, and we've, um, we've seen uh, that the potential um, impact on, on natural systems such as the, um, the coal, coal reefs in Southeast Asia. We've also talked a lot about the, the causes of climate change, the, those responsible, the, the coal industry, the palm oil industry, um, the automotive industry, the, the way transport is organized, the, uh, the way carbon credits are being used to offset other uh, emissions, etc. And we've, we've talked about some of the, the issues that are important um, in resolving, in changing these key sectors uh, towards a, a low carbon economy. And we've, we've seen that um, a lot of these issues are not just technical issues, but they're political and social issues, which are interconnected to, to global processes, but also to environmental issues um, and rights and conflicts um, that are that characterize the region um, apart from climate change. So in, in connection to climate change, but um, over uh, land rights and access to natural resources, et cetera, et cetera. The last um, couple of sessions, we've been looking more at climate justice struggles. So um, lots of different initiatives in Southeast Asia, a lot of different ways in how climate justice struggles are connected to social movements. Um, and we've, we've also had a discussion about some linkages, for example, in the campaign against Heidelberg cement. Um, so I think it's very fitting that we're ending this series with um, an active, um, a panel discussion, which is um, between activists who are really trying to achieve climate justice and to stop climate change and that it's being moderated by um, activists from the from the movement and so without further ado I'll hand over to Lara and Malin and I'm um, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you Dr. Pai and hi and welcome everyone also from my side. My name is Lara and together with Malin I'll be moderating this panel discussion today and together with Yasin, who will supporting us in the background, structuring your questions. Um, 
we are representing Students for Future Bonn, and Students for Future Bonn is, as Dr. Pai has already explained, a working group of the local Fridays for Future group here in Bonn, and we are mainly focusing on promoting climate education and climate action in the university context. So that's why we are very happy to be able to be a part of this lecture series on climate controversies in Southeast Asia. And this will be concluded with the panel discussion today, which we are looking very much forward to. So we have four amazing panelists who will be discussing perspectives for climate justice in Southeast Asia and Europe. And they will, in a minute, tell us a little bit more about themselves. So let me just say shortly, but very warmly welcome to Lin, the founder of Climate Strike Thailand, to Yuyun, campaign manager at Walhi, Indonesia's largest and oldest and environmental advocacy NGO, Lynn from Fridays for Future Bonn, and Daniel, one of the founders of Ende Gelände and activist in, clim in the climate justice movement in Rhineland since 2011. Thank you all for being here and taking the time to discuss with us today. Um, before we dive in the discussion, I would just like to explain shortly how this will work. So after the panelists will introduce themselves to us, and tell us a little bit more about themselves. Marlene and I are going to ask them some questions to start the discussion. Um, and of course, during this, um, we will not be only asking questions, but also our panelists can discuss among themselves and ask each other's questions. And we would like to encourage everyone in the audience to ask your questions. During this first round of discussion, we would love if you could write your questions in the chat and um, we will take them in. And either if they fit directly to our topic, we will ask them directly or else we will ask them in the, in the end of the first discussion round. So that will be the first part of the discussion. And in the second part, you are very welcome to join the discussion. You can either, again, write your question in the chat or you can just raise your hand, which you can do when you click on the participants list. I think you should be able to write, raise your hand there. Um, or you can just switch on your camera and um, or write in the chat if you want to join and then you can switch on your microphone and um, ask your question in person. So having said that, I would like to start the discussion and I would like to begin, as already said, with a short self-introduction of our panelists. Please tell us a little bit more about you and your group or organization. And as we have panelists not only from different countries, but also from different time zones, I would like to know from where you are joining us and what time is it at your place right now. And we also would like for you to get, give us one example of your groups or organizations activities which illustrates what you've been doing. Oh, sorry, um, maybe Lynn from Germany, would you like to start? Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, hi, my name is Lynn Reichmann. Uh, I'm from Bonn, Germany. Um, it is 16 o'clock uh, and a little bit here. Uh, I'm from Fridays for Future Germany, Fridays for Future Bonn. And yeah, uh, to present our Fridays for Future, first the question, what, what is Fridays for Future? Um, many may have heard of us. I think we're very prominent. Um, and Fridays for Future is an international climate movement, which since Greta Thunberg started to protest against the Swedish climate politics in August 2018. Um, we used to organize strikes every Friday to raise awareness for the climate emergency. But very soon, it turned into a global movement with millions of protesters all over the world. And most of them were actually school children and young adults. Um, during COVID, we have done small actions um, which are taking place to remind politicians and corporations alike that fundamental changes are necessary to stop the unfolding ecological emergency. Our main goals are um, for the politicians um, to, to adhere to the Paris Agreement, uh, agreement including um, the 1.5 degree goal for uh, um, according to the pre-industrial level and also like to unite behind the science or listen to the scientists what they say what is necessary to establish like a real climate politic. 
um, when I think about um, a project or an event or an action that was very special for us um, or for our organization, I think that the amount of people that marched with us in the global strike in August uh, 2019 was very special because we saw how many people care about the same things as we do. And we saw that like in numbers, we saw the amount of people flooding through the, through the streets, through the parks, and that actually felt really great. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to continue with you, Yun. Hi, uh, my name is Yu Yun. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm work at the uh, Climate Justice Campaign Manager in Walhi. Walhi is the uh, oldest environmental NGO in Indonesia. We turned 40 last year. <laughs> I'm not even rich 40, uh, but we basically the uh, advocacy and campaign uh, organization, but we also the umbrella organization in Indonesia with um, more than 40 uh, member uh, local organization across Indonesia. We have uh, 27 local offices right now. Uh, our works mainly uh, working with the communities uh, to defend their rights, yeah? uh, the indigenous community, the uh, local community living surrounding the forest, uh, the people impacted by the climate in the front line, especially in the uh, coastal and small island. But we're also uh, now developing uh, an agenda to working together with the youth, yeah? because uh, we see that the future of uh, this movement is uh, based on the uh, youth activism, especially in Indonesia. Um, We've done uh, several uh, lawsuits against the company as well as the government uh, in terms of forest fire, uh, on how the governments are neglecting the, the communities um, that are impacted by the forest fire in central Kalimantan, in fact, in part Krof. Uh, we win uh, that cases. Uh, the Supreme Court said that the president as well as uh, several governors should be responsible for that. Uh, we also done a uh, you know uh, the direct direct campaign in the uh, in, in in the project uh, where the dirty energy are based yeah? in, in the mine in the coal power plant as well as the uh, uh, in in the government itself whether it's local or central governments yeah thank you maybe you can still tell us um, what time is it at your place right now yeah, I'm speaking from Jakarta is. Uh, 10 at night, but I have my coffee already, so I'm wake up. Thanks a lot. So I would like to continue with Lynn. Is it also that late in Thailand right now? Hi there. Um, yeah, so it's about 10, um, 17 right now at night. Um, I am in Thailand. So um, yeah, my name is Lynn for short, but full name is Nanti Chao Jodan Chai, and um, I founded um, Climate Strike Thailand, um, I guess almost two years ago now. So yeah, it started from when around the same time that the global climate strikes were happening. And um, yeah, it was kind of an accident that I, I did it. Um, so it was all planned out within one week um, and just, planned a, a, like a strike a few people came and then more people wanted more and more so it um I just organized more but basically um throughout the year what climate strike Thailand has has been um is just a series of of climate strikes that I've organized um and it's it's no it's no you know formal structure no like one tight group it's more of like a a Facebook page I've created, which um, has has gained the interest of you know media and, and public, and brought hopefully the climate change conversation and in, into Thai uh, among the Thai public and governments um, more. And so, yeah, I think um, it's been a lot to about bringing youth activism to the forefront um, and really educating the Thai public about climate change because. While a lot of people have begun to become concerned about environmental issues, climate change is still a very 
confusing and um, untalked of topic here in Thailand. Um, so in, in this past year, though, 2020, um, I'm assuming like many other places around the world, like the climate strike, Thailand, I haven't really been organizing anything because of COVID restrictions, as well as a lot of political, um, a lot of political instability going on in Thailand, um, which still continues today. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a tough year for everyone, I'm assuming. But still, um, now as an individual, what I've been working on is, is mainly climate communications or just communications about all environmental issues in general, because here not only is the, the lack of awareness very low about all sorts of environmental issues and like in Europe, um, in Thailand, you know, there's not really a curriculum for it and there's not a lot of interest either. So I've been working um, personally on a lot of um, communications projects, you know, finding ways to make, finding ways or, or um, storytelling methods to, to really gain the interest and also engagement of, of Thai people and the, the environmental movements. Thank you. Thank you. So we will also talk about that a little bit later in this discussion, um, how to reach out to people and how to raise awareness. So that's, I think will be very interesting. But before that, um, I would like to hand over to Daniel. So could you also please introduce yourself and your group? Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm also based in Bonn, Germany. So it's for something. Um, I've been active in the Rhenish coal fields, which used to be Europe's largest source of CO2 um, since 2011, where I helped um, build the campaign to save the Hambach forest. And then in 2014-15, we founded the direct action, mass direct action group Ende Gelände, um, with which we've been doing actions of civil disobedience, physically blocking coal infrastructure with our own bodies um, for about five years now. Um, and just yesterday um, was the one year anniversary of an action that we did where we blocked um, the Datin 4 coal power plant, which is a new coal power plant that Germany has um, has built last year or finished building last year. Um, and we basically got a couple of buses together, drove there, uh, climbed over a fence and uh, yeah, sat down on the coal infrastructure. Um, and that was the anniversary um, yesterday. But usually we do actions with a couple thousand people now with the Corona pandemic, of course. A lot of things have changed. And I'm so glad to um, to be here. I'm also part of the um, international working group of Ende Gelände, where we are connecting with um, and supporting movements, um, mostly in Europe, but all around the world. Um, so very happy to be here. Yeah, thank you all for your statement. Um, it was really interesting, I mean, uh, to know about the different movements in the uh, different countries. Um, yeah, as Lara said, I'm Marlene, and I will continue now with the first questions for the panelists. So. Uh, again, now is also the chance to, um, if you have questions from the audience, audience to write them down in the chat. Um, but yeah, uh, so Daniel, I would start with you. You told us about the blockade of uh, Datlin Fear and um, yeah, and that you normally like block infrastructure of coal mining projects. And uh, it would be the first question would be like, how did Anaglender come to do this? Why are you like blocking with your bodies? Uh, these infrastructures. Thank you so much. Um, so Ende Gelände um, grew out of traditions of social movements um, in Germany and climate justice movements all around um, Europe, actually. Um, after the Copenhagen Climate Summit, which a lot of activists and organizations uh, viewed as a failure, mostly, there was a lot of um, disappointment in the movement. And then in late 2014 it was obvious that the um, COP21 summit in Paris was um, coming up and everybody had to sort of do something around that but the German movements um, did not want to mobilize towards Paris um, to beg our politicians um, once again to write a better paper that they're not going to follow on um, but instead we wanted to to fight the climate injustices on the sites where they were being produced and for us, that meant going to the Rhenish coal fields, 
these are huge open cast mines. You have to imagine eight kilometers by 10 kilometers of just nothing but destruction and coal um, mining. And going to that place, having media and cameras and social media follow us and really showing Germany and the world that this is the truth of German climate policies. No matter what they were saying of uh, Energie wenn der Weltmeister or, or of green champions, you know, this was the truth that we had to bring out um, to the German public um, through a mass mobilization because we had to also in our analysis go a step further than just doing the regular um, or in German context, um, regular NGO style demo where you meet and you walk around the block and hold up your sign. Um, but we had to actually go a step further because the climate crisis began to be <laughs> so devastating um, that we chose the, the path of direct action and civil disobedience, um, which for us meant taking our own bodies um, and sitting on these huge, huge machineries. And you have to imagine these coal machines are about a hundred meters high. So having all these small David people sitting on this Goliath machinery um, was a really powerful imagery that I think shaped the German coal and climate narratives until this day. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. Uh, thank you. I think this is like one of the things in Germany everyone knows about that people like block the actual coal mines. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, you, Yun, I guess it's a little bit different in Indonesia. Um, you already told us that you like more working with lawsuits. Um, yeah, are there any other actions that are like work really good in your country or um, do you connect with other groups and uh, how is it in comparison now to what we heard? Yeah, um, I think Daniel said perfectly about it. But then it's also uh, different countries with different contexts. Yeah. Um, have you ever to go to uh, coal mining in Indonesia? Or have you ever go to uh, power, uh, palm oil plantation in Indonesia? It will be guarded by the security there. So you have to pass several, um, uh, several blockade yeah, uh, in order you to enter the, the site. So uh, there's a challenge there. And sometimes uh, it's also difficult to do the direct action. Uh, that's why there are several options that we, we, we open to the communities. Yeah. We offer them to have a direct action, which, which we did it already. Yeah. But, uh, but Daniel said it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of an all style uh, NGOs mobilization. Yeah. Uh, but then for the communities, that's the proper way to do so. Yeah. It's safe for them. Uh, and this is also something that we need to consider as well how we can take care of uh, the communities that are working with us. Because the threat is uh, is is higher in in some some places, uh, not only for the community but so, but also for the activists uh, in Indonesia, we have uh, you know uh, it's the human rights and environmental defender is not protected by the laws, so it could be easily for companies as well as the government to prosecute them. Yeah. So uh, safety as as well as how we can push more for the, for 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 changes in terms of policies as well as in terms of the how the business are, are practicing on the ground uh, is it, something that we can consider uh, at least for now. When when the environmental and human rights defender are protected, then it can be more than just like all style uh, NGO mobilization. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there was a question, I think this is fitting right now from the chat, um, uh, with the regret, uh, like there was a Dutch case where an NGO filed a lawsuit against its own uh, government and uh, you mentioned the lawsuit and that they are effective in your country, like how, how is this, do you have like laws which are, um, which you can like pin down the governments and the companies on, or how can we imagine this? Yes, uh, uh, we also learned about the uh, cases that happening in Dutch. Yeah, uh, so it's it's, uh, it's NGOs there and putting the governments in in court. This is kind of a new uh, way of fighting when we put the climate issues or we uh, 
you know, we're not, we're not just asking the governments to change the policy, but we force them to do so in the court's decision. Yeah? Uh, we call it the climate litigation. It's something new. Uh, it's happening mostly uh, on the north, northern countries. Yeah? In the United States, you know, uh, I don't know, more than 1,000 cases uh, happens there uh, in, in Europe and several, several countries as well. But it's, you know, not much happening in southern countries such as Indonesia. Several cases happening in uh, Latin America, but then we would like to learn as well on how effective this uh, could be. I think it's a good option to, you know, to put the pressure to the governments, not only by asking them or, you know, uh, put pressure on them, but force them to do so uh, in the court case. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So we now have already learned about different methods to take action from filing lawsuits to civil disobedience to classic demonstrations and NGO work. Um, I think that one important part of creating lasting change is that we need to create broad awareness for the topic in our societies. And I think, Lynn, you already said that in your opening statement um, that there's still a lot of need of, of education and awareness for this topic. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more on whether this topic is already present in um, Thai society and politics and how do you educate people about this and which methods do you use? You mentioned, for example, storytelling. So can you give a, tell us a little bit more about that or other methods you're using? Um, so just to lay out a bit of context, there's two things. First, um, just continuing from um, Yuyun and, and Daniel, I think, you know, these the, the activism context is, is very different where, you know, in Germany, if you sit at a coal, coal plant and protest, you might be able to get away with it. But in Indonesia or other countries in Asia, like in Thailand, you might go there and then go home and get shot. Um, and yeah, the, the situation, the risk and, and danger in it is, is just completely different. Um, I've been working on this new article just about how human rights defenders and environmental justice defenders in, in Thailand and around Asia have just, you know, been really threatened um, with the sort of government. So moving on from that, just in terms of the awareness and education of, of people, I believe um, not just in Thailand alone, but, but also across Asia, um, about both environmental and, and climate issues is, is still very low. So it's like, unlike in, in Germany, in Europe, or in the US, it's hard to get people to come protest about something when they don't even truly understand it. Um, a lot of environmental issues that Thai people perceive right now are mainly still stuck on like waste management, you know, trash, um, or, or things that are more visible and immediate, like um, air pollution. Uh, whereas climate change is, is still very distant or very misunderstood. For example, you have companies that do greenwashing and then they say like, oh, use this fabric tote bag so that you can solve global warming. Um, that's still a very common phrase in, in Thailand. Um, and so, you know, in the first few strikes, just to go around with a megaphone and, and in a short period of time and in a, like a loud, atmosphere where it's strangers, no one's paying attention, and you're trying to protest and advocate about this huge issue that needs, um, you know, hours and hours of, of explaining complicated science and, and vocabulary to people who mostly don't understand anything about climate science at all. That's just very difficult. So, you know, that momentum to get the climate strike movement going in Asia is is very different from in Europe and in, U in the US. So personally, I've just found climate strikes to be a bit, a bit ineffective here. Like we've been able to gain, you know, some media exposure. Every strike, you know, for two, two, three days, we'll have a lot of media exposure and a lot of news coverage. But then after that, it will all just kind of fade away. And so that, that concern for climate change stays quite limited. Um, within this, um, the environmentalist circle, 
um, and the people who do care, they're very, you know, they're very um, passionate about it and very angry. Um, so it's great to have that because you have a lot of determination to change things, but at the same time, if you're trying to change a public, psychologically speaking, that's just very hard to do because with that kind of attitude, when you're basically you're angry and you're going to someone else, just put you and your friend in a situation, you know, you have something that you strongly believe in and you're trying to change another person's mind. But if you go at it saying, oh, you're wrong, um, you, you're stupid, you don't know any better. So, and here's what you need to do. People don't like that kind of attitude. And so I think, you know, not only in, in Asia, but across the world, I think that's where a lot of movements are stuck at. Um, and that's, you know, with the lack of, of awareness and understanding, whether it's from schools or, you know, with kids, with adults, all alike, um, people still see environmental issues as like, you know, a lot of wildlife, you know, a lot of this is about trees and nature and um, animals, but not really understanding the interconnection with all of us. Um, and so, you know, it's not really seen um, environmental issues and social justice. It's not really seen as something that, that connects. And so what I've been trying to do, it's with, with storytelling or communication methods, it's first understanding the, the local culture, which growing up, you know, I, I went to international schools, had mostly foreign friends. So it was only when I first started the climate movement here that I began understanding more about the, the public here and, and the culture here and understanding that like Thai people love fun. We love, you know, everything that's, oh, sabai, sabai, you know, easy, easy, it's okay, don't worry about it. Um, and we like being lighthearted, um, very easygoing, laid back, chill. And so if you're trying to hit people with like hard facts on, on climate science, like, oh, and in 2050, the entirety of Bangkok is going to be underwater. People listen to that and they're like, oh my God, they panic, but then they just space out and tune out and, and a, no problem gets solved. And so the other approach me and my, my work partner um, has been trying to reach is just incorporating humor, um, a lot of celebrity endorsements, a lot of lighthearted, fun, funny content into it, you know, um, to first hook the attention of people to get them to care and not close them off completely with some jargon and, and depressing facts, but to first open them up of like, oh, this is funny. This is actually entertainment value in, in our, the sort of content we create about the environmental issues and also giving offering some sort of um, hope and um, entertainment and, and um, personal benefit, you know, because because humans are, let's be honest, very self-interested, very selfish. So we, we just want anything that benefits us. So offering these kinds of benefits, um, you know, where we're just trying to work from another approach to, to create more climate awareness and, and this sort of culture and environments. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's really interesting. And I think that's really a problem activists around the world face when trying to convince um, other people. Because we have one question in the chat talking about the repression, I would just would like to say that um, we see that that is a topic that is interesting for many, I think, um, but we will talk about that a little bit later in this discussion round. Um, and I would just like to continue with this thought of how do we reach people. Um, so we have like now two representatives here from the climate strike, um, which are representing the millions of people who have been going out on the streets um, in the last years. And I would like to ask Lynn from Germany, especially here in Germany, we saw that like hundreds of thousands of people were going to the streets and remarkably was that it wasn't only people who have been engaged with environmental activism before, but also people um, who were very new to this topic. So what do you think um, did Fridays for Future right? So um, you motivated so many people to go to the street in Germany and around the world. Um, yes, well, I think what's really motivating, especially the amount of people to protest and march and organize with us is um, 
as I like I think actually that it's safe here like after what I've just heard like you can just protest it's fine like nothing really like happens if you go on a protest march in I don't know through the city center of Bonn um, of course there's always exceptions and also like I know that we also have repression in Germany but I don't think it's in the same amount in the same sizes that we have it in other parts of the world which is Basically, I think it's really uh, it complements for like doing the work you do. I think you're putting a lot more at risk uh, than like I do when I organize like a climate strike. Um, I think that's like really impressive. Um, I think what's really motivating in Germany or in Europe um, is the urgency. Um, I think yeah, maybe Germans are just a, like very serious people. They like to uh, think about problems. I don't know. Um, but uh, I think we know that there is a climate crisis um, and we do know that if we do not act now, we'll reach tipping points and these tipping points, if they, if we reach them, we will destroy whole ecosystems irrepar irreparably. Um, there's no going back at some point. And I think many people know that and have understood that, that we do not, can, we can't continue the way we do. Um, scientists have told us for decades and nothing has happened and that is very very frustrating if we know that in the future um, we're gonna have like maybe half of the forest that we have we're gonna have desert desertification we're gonna have uh, a lot more um, hurricanes and climate catastrophes all over the world um, and that is frightening and that is frustrating that if we look at that nothing is happening and this anxiety for our future, especially of young generations, our future is at risk. Like globally, the future of children and young adults is at risk. And that is what I think is leading to those massive marches. Also, we tend to forget how many great activists actually engage in the organization of weekly protests. Um, it's like their success um, that the, or the, the work of the, all of the activists that work together, um, that we have a permanence, we have the extent of Fridays of Future, and that, that is why I think we reach a lot of people and motivate them to join because they know, okay, every Friday there's gonna be a march and I can join. Um, we also have the idol of Greta Thunberg, um, which kind of shows us that nobody is too small or too young to initiate change and make the movements accessible for, uh, and that makes the, the movement accessible for generation that didn't think their voices mattered. I think we all think like that the, the movement or the things that happen in this country, the policies are dependent on, well, old white men. And um, I think we've, many of us have thought about that we've lost our voice and that we can't do anything and I think for many that is still true, but also if we engage in masses, if we show that we are a lot of people, people start to listen. I think that, that is what, like these points are things that motivate like a lot of people to go on massive strikes. Yeah, the, the, that, um, the urgency, uh, the many people that support the, the whole movement and also that we f finally, maybe m many of us finally feel like we have a voice and that we can actually reach something and influence uh, political decisions. Yeah, thank you uh, for this answer. Um, yeah, so now we come to the topic which is like interesting for everyone, I think, uh, the repression part. Um, yeah, often big companies or governments, like or sometimes governments try to silence climate justice movements as we heard in Thailand and Indonesia, but also in Germany. And um, yeah, I wanted actually to ask Daniel, how is it in Germany? Like what um, repression do you face and has it changed since you started in 2015? Um, yeah, and why do you think it has changed if it had changed? <laughs> yeah, that's the question that always comes up. People always wanna see us, get us beat up. <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, it has been mentioned before, we do these actions um, from a very privileged um, perspective, point of situation um, within the German legal democratic system. Um, there are certain um, freedoms that we do have, um, especially white activists um, 
don't really have too much to fear. Um, and I also don't think that my future is at risk <laughs> here at all. Um, globally speaking, this is not even remotely true for me. Um, but yes, we have seen um, some repression. Um, I mean, we've had over the last years, I think like seven or eight actions. So about 20,000 people, 25,000 people have joined us um, do, committing trespassing into the, the open cast mines. So we've had about probably seven, 8,000 um, court cases against us. Most of them were dismissed um, and we've been acquitted because we have great lawyers. The coal company RWE has personally sued me for 50,000 euros um, in fines because I publicly spoke about them. And in the state of Northern Westphalia, where we live in Bonn, in our state, um, where the conservative government is really um, close with the fossil fuel industry, we've all, also seen what um, people are calling the shrinking of democratic spaces. We've seen a new police law giving the police much more rights and weapons. Um, they're now just now discussing a new anti-demonstration law, which would make the style of demos that we do um, even more illegal. So we see that pushback from, from the powers that be. But nonetheless, we make this up with, and this may sound old fashioned, but solidarity, um, where people are not being left alone in these hard situations. And we've had many acquittals and we've, um, we've done fine so far. But the, I think the more interesting question is, why are we facing these repressions? And this is because we are fighting the powers that are, and we are fighting um, capital. And I think we have to integrate that in our discussion because what I mentioned um, in my beginning remarks, I don't think that we have to necessarily radicalize our tactics, our actions. This is just an expression of our analysis and our strategy. And this is different from context to context. And I think everything's fine, right? At least do something that's good. <laughs> um, I'm not advocating for one specific um, form of action. But if we, if we focus justice in our climate justice analysis, and um, if we understand that the climate crisis is being produced by capitalism and the fossil, the fossil fuels that fuel capitalism, and if we, have to, if we then um, want to interrupt the processes of capital accumulation and exploitation of the natural world, then suddenly we are a threat to people making money off the destruction of the planet. And they don't really like that. And the politicians that they've bought and the, the political system that underpins capitalism doesn't really like that. And that's why they're facing, fighting us back and not just because we broke some minor law. And I think that's really important to understand. Um, yeah, that we have, and, and I think this is what is being contested within the German climate movement right now. If it's a climate protection movement or a climate justice movement, is this about the numbers of CO2 in the atmosphere? Or is this about also non-measurable justice issues? Um, and we've seen this within Endegelände, for example, um, but within the broader climate movement as well, um, that there has been a shift towards understanding the social justice aspects um, of it as well. Um, and yeah, so yes, there has been a lot of repression, but also, I mean, this is, this is um, typical for a democratic state, a Western democratic state perhaps, reacting to a social movement that there is when they lose hegemony, um, when they don't have the support of the majority and then don't have consensus in society for their policies anymore, that there is repression, but there is also sort of adaptation um, to the demands. We see now this with the coal phase out law of 2038, um, which is from a climate perspective, ridiculous, from a justice perspective, ridiculous, but it makes sense for them because the German government is really set up on consensus building and we've we've organized the consensus away from underneath their feet and they are fighting to get that consensus back by beating us up and offering a fake alternative and it's now all our mission to to put a better alternative a real vision and a plan for a transformation out there um so i'll leave it at that yeah thank you oh thank you um uh, so you, you, and you again. Um, like we heard now about the repression system a little bit in Thailand and in, in uh, Germany. And do you face any challenges, like from big companies or from the government even, or just people who don't like what you do? Um, or are there other ch challenges that you're facing in Indonesia regarding to this aspect? 
Well, uh, it's a lot, yeah. Uh, but I will talk that later. The first one would be um, what we are working on is always based on the uh, climate justice principle. In 2020, in 2012, there is there is a document which is really good, and we need to read it again. I think it's a Bali principle on climate justice. So uh, the climate change is not only about the environment, uh, but it's also about the against the you know the uh, Daniel said the capitalism. Yeah, it's also about social justice, uh, but it's also about the gender justice and also the justice for our future generation. It stated clearly in the in the document, and we work based on that. So, uh, in the fight on the climate justice, we not you know we not only uh, try to uh, cancel or you know uh, cancel the coal power plant or uh, coal mining and so on, but we also push the recognition of uh, indigenous peoples' right, which until now is not being recognized by the government. We also push the uh, gender justice in that sense. But most importantly, yeah, uh, as I said uh, before, we also need to consider the right of our future generation. And in doing so, they have to speak up by themselves. They cannot just ask Walhi to say, you know, uh, to fight for their right. Uh, they have to speak up from, uh, by themselves, uh, for themselves. And what the Friday for Futures things is uh, what make it really special is because they speak up by themselves. And this is something that we need to push more, especially not only in the Northern countries, but also in, in, in South, Southern countries such as Indonesia. Yeah? Because, uh, it, 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 because they cannot be represented anymore. They have to speak by themselves. And in Indonesian context, it's really, uh, you know, match because most of our population now, yeah, it's under 30, yeah. So, and in the recent uh, survey by uh, by Compass, Compass is uh, most biggest and oldest uh, newspaper in Indonesia. People under 30, they disappointed with the government's policy on environment. So there is a chance there that we need to organize more in the uh, intergenerational justice perspective on how we're dealing with the climate policy in Indonesia. So uh, that's why we, we invited them to have, you know, uh, we invited them to be our researcher. There is three young people. Uh, they really involved in the, uh, they in Indonesia, we call it uh, Jeda Iklim. Yeah? It's, it's, Indonesian, it's Indonesian name for, uh, uh, for, for climate strike. Uh, so we asked them to give us a proper analysis on the Indonesian government's policy in, in intergenerational justice perspective. And they made that uh, by themselves with their analysis and they put their demand. While he only helped them uh, to give a room for them for, for campaigning, for uh, discuss with the public and so on and so forth. So. Uh, we can collaborate, yeah. Uh, while he is, as, as I said before, while, while he is not young or youth uh, NGOs, yeah. yeah. But we see the, the future of this uh, movement is lies uh, on the involvement of this uh, generation, especially the generation under thirty in Indonesia. Um, the, you know, the uh, the legal cases is also have a consequence as well yeah uh, recently we lost our uh, good lawyer in north sumatra against uh, the um, the big hydro uh, power plant there so we we put the uh, the challenge on the legal system especially the environmental permit permit in court and then uh, our uh, lawyers uh, young lawyers activists uh, died because of that well, the government say that it's a solo accident of, uh, you know, motorcycle accident, but there is a reason behind it because uh, we see several threats uh, to him, not only him, but also our college in North Sumatra. So there is a risk as well in the, in the, in the legal battle, yeah? not only direct action, but also in legal battle. Uh, when you see in social media, for example, in Indonesia, how 
how the indigenous community leader in in central Kalimantan are being grabbed by the by the police yeah uh, a group of police uh, grabbing him uh, from his house and and try to bring it to the uh, police uh, office yeah um, some one of our uh, colleagues in the community able to capture that and then uh, he's, he sent it out to us and then we can spreading out to the social media. The solidarity works, yeah? People see that as in, as in justice uh, and then we can manage uh, to put pressure to the government to release this uh, FND booing the indigenous uh, leader in central Kalimantan. Well, I mean, it's not easy, yes, but it worth uh, to try, I mean, we have a common understanding with Daniel. Uh, we do that on how we do that because we also are aware of the risk, but we have to calculate that so that it will not, uh, you know, uh, become a burden for uh, the community, their families, as well as as well as the uh, uh, families of the activists. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, maybe we can just continue with one question who was, which was in the chat from Yuta. She asked, how do activists protect themselves against those threats from corporation or governments? Do you have like measures you can take so that it's maybe a little bit more safe? Maybe Yuyun, um, do you like to continue on that? Or um, maybe also Lynn can tell us something about that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we should create a room or spaces that safe for the community to speak, speaking up against, against uh, you know, uh, the development of some project or, uh, you know, um, a dirty project uh, that, that, you know, create the climate change and so on. That's why we push the Indonesian governments to have a policy that uh, it will protect the environmental and human rights defender especially the one who's uh, you know uh, against the government's policies it will be it's only at the beginning we still have to uh, do more work on that the second one would be uh, so, you know the now social media are are really have an, have an impact yeah i mean to spreading out the information the, it's really fast so that uh, you can have the you know uh, people are uh, you know speaking speaking up in social media I don't know, maybe they will, will not go to the street, but at least they will say that this is wrong, this is false, we need to stop that and so on and so forth. Uh, and the second one would be, we need to assess our activities, you know, we have, we need to provide a safe space for the communities against the uh, companies or against the government's policies. And uh, we cannot do that by ourselves, we have to collaborate with the uh, others, uh, others organization as well not only in the country but also in, in other country as well so that it will create a safe environment for the activists to activists and the communities to to do their uh, you know criticism to the government and the companies thank you when speaking about repression and um, protest i would like to ask lynn um, Thailand has been in international media in the past year for the huge democracy movement. Um, and maybe you can just give us like one or two sentences about that for people who haven't heard about it yet. And we would like to ask you um, whether you see synergies between the democracy movement and climate activism, um, or what do you think are the effects of the democracy movement um, on Thai climate activism? So um, long story short, um, we've had a series of political, um, you know, this party wins, that party is not happy and then they fight. And then, so one year the military took over, um, they did a coup and then since they've basically self-elected to become the, the elected governments which is our current government. Um, and then now, you know, after several, like after five, six years, people are, are no longer okay with that. So they've been protesting a lot, demanding dem democracy, um, particularly beginning last year, you know, lots of uprisings, especially from youth activists. 
And so, um, yeah, I've I've discussed with a few people about it, you know, um, possibilities and in, in integrating the climate movement in this pro-democracy um, movement. But as mentioned, um, you know, with the lack of awareness and understanding about climate issues and environmental issues in general, when people don't understand the interconnection or intersectionality between um, you know, the, just the understanding of what climate justice is and how, how environmental issues also um, breach human rights and, and affect humans um, and how these all play in various um, social issues like the right to breathe clean air and have access to clean water. Um, when people don't understand that, um, the, the perception with bringing the climate justice into the social um, movements become something like, let's keep the environmental issues for later. Let's solve the people problems first. Let's make sure that people have enough to eat and, and that people are not being abused and harassed first before we move on to the topic about cutting down trees and saving animals. Um, so yeah, without that understanding, it's still very hard to try to integrate environmental issues into it. Although I think a lot more people have began to understand. Um, I tried once, you know, speaking up about the political issues going on, but there were actually surprising a lot, a lot of people who were like, hey, we don't want this, you know, please keep, um, please keep political issues aside, like um, away from your, your Facebook page because like you should stay um, unbiased. You're just working on the environment. You shouldn't be on either side. And that's in, to me and, and a lot of people who actually understand, you know, the interconnection, just, it, it's just a, a mind blow because clearly, that, that shows that a lot of people still don't understand how much politics influences our, our climate um, policies. And yeah, yeah it's just, it, it's, it's confusing how, how that's not seen about how the laws are, are enforced and how that plays with say like the fossil fuel industry or, or the food industry, all sorts of industries. So a lot of people still don't understand how like corruption politics and all of that plays a role in, in um, our basic environmental rights. And so, yeah, it's, it's just been very difficult to, to you know, form that synergy that you speak about. Um, but of course, we're still trying to find ways. I think it, it just all begins first with educating and informing the, the public about um, this connection between the two. Thank you very much. Um... Maybe we have had a um, question about whether people would choose between whether or how people would choose if they had to choose between economic welfare and environment. Um, I think you already kind of answered it. Maybe um, the questioner can give me a sign whether we should proceed with that question or it's answered. Well, yeah, I, I think that that can still be answered wherein like people, like if you don't understand about the issue, then then if the government hand, gives you money handouts and, and you know, saying they, that they would solve climate issues, people, most people would choose right away, just give me this, you know, 100 euros in cash within this month, it will help ease my life a lot more than you trying to solve climate issues because climate is, is such a distant issue and and money seems to be the thing you know most handy in like an immediate situation um so that's a lot of times you know just politically speaking that's how they win votes as well by having hand giving out a lot of temporary fixes like money handouts um, so yes, yeah, as, as long as people don't understand that bigger picture, that more long-term um, issue at hand, they will choose that kind of economic incentive um, because they don't understand that on the long run, having a good environment means having a good an economic return on investment. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so now I we 
come to the end of the first part of the discussion round um, and later on we will ask all of your questions which we haven't asked yet and also you can um, join in and ask your questions but before that I would um, direct my last question to Lynn from Germany. Um, so we know that the climate crisis is mainly caused by states of the global north like Germany. Um, and I would like to hear your perspective on which role climate justice, as mentioned before, um, again and again, and Germany's responsibility plays in the Fridays for Future protests here. Um, would you say that the demands of Fridays for Future represent this responsibility of Germany? And how, in your perception, is the topic also debated out of the inner circle of the climate movement? Yes, I think that's a difficult question because, I mean, I'm in my, my own media bubble and my own bubble of like people that think like, like me. And I think many people in Fridays for Future, we're kind of like concerning our thinking on climate justice. So um, I think Mm, it's it's so difficult. I th for me, climate justice uh, and the need for climate justice is very clear. It's very obvious. Um, also for the people around me. Um, also with uh, being critical of of capitalism and that, that for me that is that is obvious. For me that is clear. But I don't feel like that arrives in society, and I also don't know how to make <laughs> society understand because uh, that is a really really hard process and i feel like sometimes people have to grow into it so i can't just like hit them with the or like our organization can't just hit them with like you should think more because that would be very paternalistic and that's not what we want to do um but yeah maybe we have to fight more for climate justice uh, and be be clearer about where the where the problem lies that it's not just that everybody has to cut out meat in their diet and then the world is safe but that there we have to really structure like discover the structures that made uh, this destruction of, of climate and of nature possible and to like reverse these thinkings and these these ideas that we had about how the world works and rethink about how can we make the world a more sustainable place and a more like a, a better place for, for everybody also concerning climate uh, struggles um yeah i think that is very very central um but i also feel like the yeah the the perspective of the public on climate issues has changed a lot it does has not changed enough, I'm sure, but um, I, I see that big companies are being held account, uh, accountable by their customers. Sustainability has become a selling point within the economy. Um, I think many of the efforts can be dismissed as greenwashing, but there are also companies that are restructuring their approaches in production and at least consider their climate effects and government implementation policy uh, and yeah, and governments implement policies to ec ecologically regulate the economy. I know there's always a lot to be done and I know that it, this is not sufficient, but I feel like at least it's a start, at least we're starting somewhere and at least there's more awareness and maybe we can like take little steps at the moment. Um, and I feel like that has arrived in the center. There is a lot of backlash um with uh right-wing qualities and conservatives concerning um climate movements um i feel like many people think that we're going to take away the suvs um and they feel like we're robbing them or something which is basically not true we're just giving the children a future so it's more like giving instead of taking um and i feel like there is a, like just a, a little like we're having different approaches in thinking and like I think the whole climate move movement, of course, thinks that they are doing the right thing, but other people think that we're actually like making our uh, okay, economy collapse and the world is going to break down because uh, the economy doesn't work the way it does right now because we're all more into climate change. I think, yeah. So I think on the one side, yes, there's more climate um, awareness on the one hand, and on the other hand, there is also a lot of opposition. I think that the, the measures that the global north is taking is not enough, but we are on a way and I hope that in the future with more, even more awareness, maybe we're going to be able to take the right steps into a better future. 
Yeah, thank you very much for this answer, Lynn. Um, so now we like we are finished with the official part, with the official questions we prepared in beforehand. So uh, now would be the time to uh, for the audience to ask the question. You can also ask your question by raising your hand and like speaking by yourself. Uh, but we will also we also have collected the other questions which came by chat. Um, so maybe I will just start um, with. Uh, yeah, with one of the questions came by chat, and this was regarding to the interconnection between the different countries and the global, um, yeah, the global connections, uh, uh, which were, and there was this question, do there exist international networks working, working together between Asia and Europe, but also including Africa and South America? Um, yeah, so this is not really directed at one of you, so I think it's just uh, up to you who wants to ask, who, uh, who wants to answer to this, so. Um, yeah, you can just uh, talk if you want to. I will not pick anyone, yeah. <laughs> I could give it a shot, but if somebody else wants it. Um, okay, so personally, I've been more um, involved in, in international um, organizations that work within the global north and the west. Um, but for example, one, but there are, various um, organizations um, and one thing that I've found really beautiful was in 2017 when the International Climate Conference um, COP 20 something was in Bonn um, just outside of our doors um, it was a situation where the where the global climate negotiations happened in Germany 50 kilometers away from the mines that are polluting um, the climate and Originally, the, the conference was to be um, held by the island state of Fiji, um, but they couldn't do it. And so because Bonn has the international neutral, whatever, UN um, headquarters, it was held here. And how absurd is it to bring people from all, and, and it was just everything of climate injustice and climate justice came together within like 50 square miles there. Um, and there, was the, there were the Pacific climate warriors which um, is a group of mostly indigenous um, organizers from the Pacific, from various Pacific islands, who um, who held a traditional um, ceremony in a village that is to be destroyed for the coal mine. Um, it was a very very moving um, act of solidarity that they showed us. Um, it was a great honor that they um, held that ceremony, and it really fueled um, the mo movement for years to come. Um, and this international um, collaboration and cross-pollinization um, really brought also some depth to the movement. Um, and yeah, so I think this was one, one of the prime examples where international cooperation was shown in action. Um, but I also want to challenge our notion of activism here in this conversation, because I don't think that activism necessarily has to be like doing actions, um, because that really easily then uh, blends into like this super macho guy who's like doing the radical um, hardcore militant stuff. And I think it's also a really neoliberal um, individualized notion of political change. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's a gr vastly greater um, range of activities um, that are part of chain, changing the world than just you know doing actions. Um, so. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, thank you. Um, does any of the others want to answer to this question as well, or should we go on? Okay, I take this as a no. Uh, that's fine. No worries. Uh, yeah, I think there's a question from Pai. Pai, thanks. Uh, thanks, Marlene. Um, yeah, so this is a question maybe to whoever wants to answer it from the panel. Um, some of you have already talked about the connection between capitalism and, and climate, uh, the climate catastrophe. Um, but I think the uh, the question is then, you know, how to overcome capitalism. So my question is, uh, what's the relation between the climate justice movement and the labor movement? Uh, I know Daniel uh, Endigalender, the relationship with the miners' union hasn't been the best one. Um, so how how do you uh, but also in, in Indonesia, how do you see this this connection? Um, 
what do you think about just transition perspectives and bringing in workers as an active um, alliance to transform specific industries? You can just answer. Okay. Um, um, yeah, we, we do have like a, and we always have the, the argument of actually the, the conservative part that with the transformation of, of for example, energy sources, we're going to lose a lot of, lot of jobs. Um, this is actually not completely true because I, we know we could, we could have done a change in, um, in production of energy a long time for, for a long time or a lot, a lot a lot longer so if in the 90s where the first um questions were asked uh, about how to deal with coal and they would have said okay coal is getting more expensive in germany it doesn't have a future and would have said okay so the next 30 years we will change our renewable renewable energy to renewable energy sources and in this period all of the miners could have um, been done with working. They would have worked for 30 more years. The person the, that was last initiated to the company would have been done with working, would have been um, like, it, they, they could have just like turned the company and then been a renewable co company without loss of actual workers. So it's, I think it's just a question of like, how do you really want to change the system? Um, and changing the system isn't like from today to tomorrow, but there there are concepts on how to uh, actually deal with with these issues. And uh, I think it's also like researchers, social so, so, sociological researchers that actually can give answers to this question um, because there is um, opportunities. Also, we have to rethink because we're always talking about the people that work in the mines and the miners, um, but actually um, renewable energy sources and the production of renewable energies um, gives a lot more jobs than actual like mines do. So when we say talk about loss of jobs, there were actually more loss and more jobs lost because the, um, the fundings for renewable energy sources got cut by the German government. So apparently the German government does not care about like sustaining jobs but more about like the the lobby that RVE and the coal in, um, industry have in, in themselves. So yeah, but also of course the climate justice movement has to be intersectional, and we have to make the climate uh, justice movement accessible for everybody. That also means taking care of those who um, would actually lose jobs, and making sure that th there is an opportunity and there is a good a way of, of uh, continuing um, and working together. Um, yes, but I think um, doing, doing the work means that we create jobs in a different sector and not continue working in coal because that is just a, not just a sustainable way of uh, working. Yeah, thank you. Um, anyone else who wants to answer to this? So if yes, now's the chance. Otherwise, I will go on. Um, yeah, you can talk. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's, Oliver always have a good question and we have to think uh, very hard of that. Um, before we talk about the just transition and how we work with the labor, we need to also uh, talk about what next after fossil fuels. Yeah what next after uh, oil, gas, and, uh, and uh, coal and stuff. It seems that the uh, climate now, you know, the climate solutions now goes uh, metals, not all metals, but on the specific metals that uh, needed for the uh, decarbonization in the, in the transportation sector. It will be nickel, it will be cobalt, and uh, you know uh, some others uh, rare earths uh, that now being picking up uh, for the need for the uh, decarbonization in the transportation sector. Well, I don't think that uh, Europe will allow us to digging up a nickel mine in their land. Yeah, uh, they probably have to take that mine from uh, the other countries. 
and unfortunately that Indonesia have a huge resource of nickel in Sulawesi and some part of Papua. So that will be the next exploitation. Yeah? Uh, and we want to transition from the dirty energy to renewable, but then the renewable ones need to be transitioned as well from its production and consumption. You know? uh, so it's not only a just transition, um, it also should be or must be the just material transition. Without that, then it will not relate uh, what happening in the north, uh, where the discourse of the just transitions are, uh, you know, uh, really developed there on how to work together with labor and so on and so forth. Uh, but then the source of material still come from our own backyard. Yeah, so it's going to be difficult for us to talk about the just transition in that term without talking first uh, the just material transition. Um, we can discuss more on that, but I think it's going to be a nice challenge for the, for the, for the climate movement. Thanks. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, Daniel, you wanted to say something as well. Go on. Yes, I, I also find, find this question really interesting and it, it's obviously the one question that we don't have an answer to, like how do we overcome capitalism if I knew I already done it um, or helped doing it. Um, but I think it's a, I think it's a key question and Union, I'm so thankful for you um, raising up these issues of also false transitions. Um, we are seeing in Germany a lot of discourse, really shallow discourse on soft transitions, you know, from coal to gas to fossil gas, or with mobility that's being like pushed as the new topic to electro I mean, mobility or hydrogen or biofuels. And I think we really have to be aware of these technocratic um, neo-colonial green solutions that are no solutions. And I think there has been a sort of a shift within the movement too. Um, five years ago, six years ago, um, it was really focused on coal. We need to keep this specific, you know, piece of coal under this German village in the ground, and that's it. And I think now the it's been um, it's been fought for that the 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 horizon, the perspective of the climate justice movement in Germany has been widened to these questions of you know you you've seen it also in the previous um, lectures on Red Plus or or the um, other extraction um, industries. Um, so I think we have to be really sensitive of what transition is not the transition that we want. And we also have to understand that um, Germany is a colonial state, has always been and still is. And if we are to fight the climate crisis, then we have to completely dismantle the structures that are foundational to our society. And I don't necessarily know what that means like in detail, but that is a question that we've not even started to really also push as demands as a movement. We've not really called for reparations. We've not really called for a democratization of the companies. We've not really um, called to, for all these like things that were necessary if we were to take our own analysis um, serious. And so I think there's still a lot of work to do um, in that regard. Um, Yes, and, and the whole fault solution thing is a really dangerous trap because it, it, it takes our pressure that we have built up and it sort of diverts it in the wrong ways. And then it's like, a, oh, it's a green car now, but it's still a car that's being like, you know, um, produced by neocolonial structures. So um, we have to be really sensitive um, of that. And also I think this is lastly, um, for the German movement, a, a specific um, task that's ahead of us is to not use this discourse that I just opened as an excuse for not um, fighting racism within Germany, because it's really easy to be like, oh, we are so anti-racist because we're like fighting colonialism at the other side of the world, which is good and we should do it, but um, really start working on, on also rebuilding our own movement in a, in a better way that we've, that, than we've set it up five years ago. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you also for this answer. Um, so there is, uh, yeah, 
there weren't any more questions from the chat, but if you still have a question or if you activists uh, from the panel discussion, if you have like to the other ones a question, um, feel, feel open to ask this now. Um, so this would be like the last chance because I saw that we already like one and a half hours about uh, going on. Um, so yeah, if, if there's uh, still a question you really want to ask now, um, there would be the chance. Or also by chat. Okay, uh, well, yeah. Uh, no worries, it's been a long day for all, I guess, especially for you, uh, where the time zone is a little bit different than here. <laughs> uh, okay, so then uh, thank you all for this discussion. And then I would uh, go to La back to Lara because, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I think that was a really interesting and also very inspiring discussion. So thank you for that. We've heard about many things from methods of taking action to repression, to overcoming capitalism um, and just transition. So I think that has been a wide range of discussion and um, now would be the moment to wrap up all this discussion and we would like to hear a closing statement from each panelist. Um, maybe you can tell us something about what are you working on in the moment, if you're working on something in the moment. Um, if people want to get involved, how can they do this? And um, do you have maybe tips for people who haven't been active yet, but would like to become active now? And of course, if there's also something um, you weren't able to share with us yet, but you would like to um, tell the audience, now is your time. And um, maybe let's start with Daniel. Well, thank you so much for organizing and facilitating this. I found it really interesting and inspiring too. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Um, yeah, for people who are in Bonn, there's a there are a great variety of climate justice organizations here in Bonn. Endegelende has 50 chapters all around the country and some international. Um, and I'm really grateful um, that after decades of neoliberal nihilism of there is no alternative of just nothingness of the future, that we are finally starting to re-engage with that conversation of what is our future actually going to look like. Might not have all the answers, but raising that question is a political step um, in and for itself. Um, and yeah, I'm so grateful for Lynn and Yuyan's work um, too, because it's obvious that you're the, you're the organic leaders of the global um, movement. Um, so yeah, really happy to, to have gotten to know you and I'm sure we'll keep this conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you. So maybe let's continue with Yuyan. Yeah, uh, I was occupying your pit in 2015 as well as in uh, I don't know, in, in COP23 in Bonn. So I invite uh, Daniel to occupy the coal mining in Indonesia in the next future, yeah, if it's possible. So uh, uh, let's do that together. Thank you, uh, Oliver, and all of the team for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, maybe continue, we continue with Lynn from Climate Strike Thailand. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having me and everyone. Um, it's it's a real it's it's really nice to be able to share what we have going on our uh, on our side of the world here. You know, it's there is a lot of traction um, from that other half of the world, but it's good to share our experiences and difficulties and just the kind of um, situation that we we deal with here to you know be able to understand the context better. Um, but that aside, I just wanted to tell everyone like, you know, this is serious stuff, climate crisis and all, it can really mess with your head. So please, please um, stay happy. Like, <laughs> you know, do, like, you know, spend the day fighting and, and trying to save our planet, but at the same time also stay sane. Um, remember to take care of yourself and, find the little joys in life and, and don't, you know, dwell too much over the climate crisis because we still have quite a long way to go and there is a lot of hope. Um, so yeah, have fun with the work. Um, I'd like to leave with that and yeah, 
um, stay positive, see this as like a nice fun challenge and I wish you all the best. Thank you, very beautiful words I think um, to end with and that's the wish we definitely have for everyone here in this meeting. So Lynn from Fridays for Future here in Bonn, um, what's your final statement? Yes, thank you everybody. It was really like inspiring to hear everybody talk about what their fight is. Uh, I feel like it's really great to see that uh, we're like never alone and that there's so many people that like join us and that uh, even though everybody does like a different different work, we're all like working towards one goal and I feel like all of the ways are actually effective. Um, concerning the topic of uh, how how to, to join the climate movement, I think it's always a good idea to like research on like what uh, the town where you live in or the city that you live in offers and maybe like text them on social media, ask if you can join somehow, that's always a good idea. Um, also, there's going to be a global climate strike on the 19th of March um, with the, I think the slogan, no more empty promises. Um, I hope all the people from Bonn and from Germany and all, also all over the world will maybe like join and show like in, uh, we don't know how it's going to happen because of Corona, but maybe we can like send like a message that this is urgent and that there's a lot of people behind this. Um, yeah, I hope uh, that we can all continue like effectively doing the, the work that we do um, with our prospective groups. And I think your work is very, very important. Thank you for doing your work. Thank you for hosting this meeting. And uh, yeah, I think that's my, my final statement. I think you're all doing great jobs. Thank you for that. And thank you to all our four panelists again for taking your time and for giving us your inspiring input. Um, I would also like to thank the organizers of this lecture series, naming um, the Department of Southeast Asian Studies at the University of Bonn, the Stiftung Asian House, the Philippine Bureau, Fridays for Future Cologne, and our Students for Future group. And I think we'll have some closing remarks um, by the organizing groups. So I'll hand over to Dr. Pai for that. Thanks, Lara, and uh, thank you to, to everyone who, who joined this. It was, I think, it was a fantastic uh, discussion, um, and I hope uh, one of many that we'll have in in, in future. Um, our department has been, you know, involved in the climate justice movement for for many years already, um, especially with this kind of interaction. Um, we've we've organised study trips to to COP protests and uh, and that kind of thing. But I think Yuyun's idea uh, to invite Daniel and uh, Ende Gelende to occupy a coal mine, maybe that would be an interesting study trip uh, for, for the department to organize. Um, we could call it participant uh, observation. Um, so maybe that's a good idea for the, for the future. And um, yeah, so um, please you know, um, keep in, in touch and uh, Oh, I was inspired with, as an old white man, it's good to see the young uh, generation kicking ass. Thanks. So thanks everyone also in the audience for your attention. Um, maybe um, Stiftung Asien has, would like to say something? Um, yes, hey, me again, Majid. Uh, I will be speaking on behalf of Stiftung Asien House and Philippine Bureau first. And in this role, I would like to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for co-organizing this. Thank you for participating. Thank you for listening. It's been great. This is what we try to do. We try to connect civil society from the global north and the global south to exchange ideas, to cooperate, to, to deepen and interlink our struggles so that we can work together on overcoming the challenges that we are faced with. And I feel that this has been extremely helpful in this regard. Really, thank you very much. And now I will speak as a member of the working group on resources, uh, which also is theoretically co-organizing this. Um, if you want to cooperate further on some of the issues we touched on here, for example, on the uh, cement, extractive industries in Indonesia 
or on some of the the issues on palm oil we heard about today um or just on um, global global solidarity and solidarity along the production chain in general please join us at the working group on resources i'll post the link in the chat the web page is sadly only in german but just hit me up on that email and our next meeting is on friday already so if you want to get in touch just get in touch with me and i'll send you the invite thank you very much it was great have a nice evening thank you um, i'm not sure whether fridays for future cologne is here to say some final remarks um, otherwise i think i'll say in the name of students of future that we were very happy to be part of this series and also, if you want to get involved with Students for Future um, or Fridays for Future Bond, you can just, um, I think all the contact information is in the internet and on our social media, and we'll be very happy to welcome you in our group. Otherwise, I just wish you a pleasant evening and thanks again for being here. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Oli. Thank you. Bye-bye. Tschüss. Bye. Bye.